we are now going to look at something called KKT conditions or Karush Kun Kun Tucker condition. So again, we have this primal problem, minimize f of x subject to h i x less than or equal to 0 for every i in n l j x equal to 0. So this is the uh, primal optimization problem and we define the Lagrangian for this primal problem in terms of lambda and nu where lambda is are the uh, Lagrange variables are the dual variables like uh, with respect to the inequality constraints and nu are uh, with respect to the equality constraint and this was defined to be f of x. Okay. So, what are KKT conditions? So, the first condition is stationarity, okay, which says that. So, why do we need Lagrangian and why do we why do we use Lagrangian? What does Lagrangian help with? Yeah, it converts the constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained optimization problem, right? So that means if for for let's say for a point x star, lambda star, and nu star to be optimal point, so zero must belong to this particular set of right or x lambda nu. So the gradient must be like you be zero. So that is the stationarity condition. Then there is uh, something called complementary slackness. Which says lambda i h i of x, this is equal to 0 for every i. So either the constraint is 0 or the corresponding Lagrange multiplier is 0, right? Why? Because the optimal this term, you want this to be equal to f of x, right? We know that lg of x is anyway 0 for feasible point. If the point is not feasible, I mean you will have these inequality constraints as well, right? So if like if let us say you, because you want this to be equal to this, uh, this anyway you know that this is less than equal to 0 and this particular term is greater than equal to 0. So overall this term is less than equal to 0. Complementary slackness says that the individually each of these terms, the product of lambda i's and the h i of x this is going to be 0 for every i. So either the constraints are going to be active meaning constraints are going to be satisfied with the equality, the inequality constraint or the lambda i's are going to be 0. So that is complementary slackness. Then you have something called primal feasibility. So primal feasibility is, I mean the pri primal problem should be feasible. So you have h i of x less than equal to 0 and l j of x equal to 0 for every i j. So these are just, I am just writing on the condition so far and then you have dual feasibility. So dual feasibility is that lambda i should be greater than equal to 0, right? That is that's the, uh, that's the constraint that we have on the dual variables so for every i. So uh, you can have, but then I mean, let's say one of the constraints is trivially satisfied, right? So in general, like so, basically it holds for every constraint and not just just the sum of it, right? So I mean, in fact, I'm going to have like have you guys uh, prove this uh, the next theorem that I'm going to write. But so these like are the four cons constraints clear to everyone? We did not show anything. I mean, I am just saying that I, as of now I have just written the four constraints, okay. So,
So let me just write down the theorem statement. Uh, so again, uh, we are considering convex optimization. So everything you assume that f, f h and l are the convex function. So for a, for an optimization problem or a primal problem rather or optimization problem with strong duality. Okay. So we say x star is a primal optimal solution. Primal. solution and the pair lambda star and nu star is a dual optimal solution. If and only if x star, lambda star, nu star satisfy the KKT condition. So remember when we looked at strong duality we had one statement that if the strong duality holds then KKT conditions which are always sufficient also become necessary. So this is if and only if condition. So KKT conditions are both sufficient and necessary for let us say x. So what, what this particular theorem says is that if x star, lambda star and nu star if you can find these points which basically satisfy the KKT conditions these are also going to be uh, primal and dual optimal solutions. Is the statement clear to everyone? Yeah. Complementary slackness, yes. Sigma is also 0. And that is when you get, I mean, the optimal value of the Lagrangian is same as the optimal function value. Okay. All right. So let us look at an example. So we will consider the quadratic opt, uh, a QP with equality constraint, quadratic program with equality constraint. So the problem is minimize x half x transpose qx plus c transpose x subject to ax equal to b. You can assume q to be positive definite, it is fine. And let us derive the KKT conditions for this. So first of all, is this problem, uh, like does the strong duality hold here? Again you have, I mean there are no inequality constraints. So I mean we, the question of strict feasibility does not even come in here. You have just the equality constraint, no inequality constraints. I mean it is you have a convex problem to work with, convex constraints, so it is fine, strong duality holds. Okay. So because strong duality holds, I mean KKT conditions are going to be both sufficient and necessary. So let us look at the KKT conditions. First of all, let us look at the Lagrangian, there is no lambda here, just uh, nu. So the Lagrangian is going to be Okay. So what is the first condition? The stationarity condition. So let us look at the stationarity condition. So the gradient of x, a uh, gradient of Lagrangian with respect to x that should be equal to 0 at the optimal x star and nu star. Okay. So what is the gradient of Lagrangian with respect to x? What is the gradient of the first term? qx, let us call it qx star because we are evaluating at x star plus c plus a transpose lambda, this should be equal to z. Sorry, yeah, a transpose mu, my bad, thank you. Let us call it nu star, right? This should be equal to 0. The second condition does not even show up. So complementary slackness because there are no inequality constraints. So complementary slackness is not there. What about primal feasibility? 
primal feasibility would require this to be equal to 0, right? So that means another constraint that we have is ax star minus b equal to 0 or ax star equal to b, that is another constraint. And again dual feasibility does not even show up here. So the solution to this particular, uh, so you have x star nu star and this, this you get to be minus c comma b, you have q, a transpose, uh, okay. So the optimal solution is basically the solution to these, uh, this and these set of linear equations, okay. So if you solve, so KKT conditions obviously help you solve an optimization problem, particularly if strong duality holds then, uh, then uh, it, they are both sufficient as well as necessary. But the real use case of KKT condition is to, uh, is to check optimality. So when you are writing, uh, so when you are writing an opt, like let us say you develop an algorithm to solve an constrained optimization problem, you know that uh, I mean you can, you, like if these constraints are satisfied, that means you have arrived at the optimal solution. So in this case, I mean it is easier to, I mean in, this is a simple enough example, uh, you can for quality program you can quickly solve it like this. But in general, like let us say you have an equality constraints and in general it is not a quality program, you have a more complex looking function. KKT conditions are often used to provide optimality certificates, whether you have arrived at the optimal solution or not. And the way to evaluate this is, if you see that the at the value of x that you currently have, if uh, the gradient has almost vanished, uh, the lambdas that you have, uh, the complementary slackness condition is satisfied, primal and dual feasibility are there. As long as all these conditions are satisfied, that means uh, you have arrived at the optimal solution, okay. So they are often used to check optimality or suboptimality, but and only sel seldom they are used to solve an optimization problem like in this case. We have solved it using KKT conditions, but more often than not we use it to verify whether we have arrived at optimal solution. Yeah, so I will also look at the inequality problem as well. Just in fact the same SVM problem is what we are going to look at. So the same dual of SVM, if you look at, so here in, in the dual of SVM we, we get some inequality constraint as well, right. So the inequality constraint or in the primal form of SVM, these are the inequality constraints that we have. So, so what does complementary slackness condition? So again, uh, so inequality constraints in the primal form were, let me just rewrite it. So what, what were the inequality constraints? Lambda i or uh, the inequality constraints are y i w transpose x i plus v, they should be greater than or equal to 1 or rather 1 minus So this is less than or equal to 0 for all i. Okay. So if I apply the KKT condition, so complementary slackness is one of the conditions that we should check, right? And what does complementary slackness tell you? At the optimal, dual optimal solution lambda i star, so lambda i star times 1 minus w star, let us say w star transpose x i plus b star. So this should be equal to 0, right. So that is the complementary slackness condition, lambda i times h i of x that should be equal to 0, okay. So how, how is this possible? Either this is, so this implies that either lambda is equal to 0 or the other term is equal to 0. If lambda equal to 0, then uh, this constraint need not be active, it can have uh, some other value. But if uh, lambda is not equal to 0, then that means 1 minus y i, there exists one particular x i such that and y i such that this is equal to 0 for some i, right. And in fact, these are the points which are called support vectors. 
support vectors and if I look at what support vectors are vectorially. So, these are your support vectors the point. So, this is the equation of uh, as we said the minimum distance of this point is 1 right. So, these are the support vectors and for these set of points lambda i's is are non zero and you get the constraint that w transpose x plus b equal to 0 or equal to 1 or y i times this term is equal to 1. Is this clear? So, this also gives you a way to uh, so because you know the corresponding x i star or uh, the point i for which lambda is not equal to 0 this is how you can evaluate your b star ok. So, if you find your support vectors you can evaluate your b star from there and this is this is where KKT conditions can be used. But the KKT the points for which lambda is not equal to 0 these are these basically define your support vectors and so in this case they I mean it has a geometrical meaning to it ok. So, we are now going to be uh, looking into uh, design and analysis of optimization algorithms right. So, and the idea is uh, let us let us consider a very simple let us say we are trying to minimize a function and we consider the level sets of the function. and so on ok. So, these are the level sets of the function and let us say you start somewhere over here ok. So, uh, and how does gradient descent work? So, gradient in gradient descent what do we do? x k plus 1 is x k minus some step size times this thing right. So, the level set I mean so essentially the gradient would be pointing in the orthogonal direction to it right. So, it would be pointing let us say in this direction like this. So, wherever we are we then uh, basically move in the direction of the gradient or then the direction of the steepest descent and let us say we arrive at this particular level curve. Now, at this point let us say this is after one iteration at this point the gradient would be pointing orthogonal to it. So, maybe we arrive somewhere over here let us draw this le uh, level curve here as well. Again we would be moving in the orthogonal direction and we arrive somewhere over let us say here somewhere here, here, here and so on right and eventually we would converge to the optimal solution and that is how gradient descent in general works. But one thing that you can notice here for instance is with this kind of uh, this kind of approach you get a very zigzaggy path to the optimal solution or the optimal value right the op like when x converges to the optimizer you have a very zigzaggy way uh, in which x sort of moves towards the optimizer. And this is the nature of like first order optimization algorithm where you just use a like let us say you just work with the x and you use the gradient information. Instead what you can use is something called momentum right and if you guys do not know what momentum is I mean it basically has a similar sort of uh, uh, connotation here as well and the idea is. So, I am going to be moving in the direction of the steepest descent, but not entirely I will be using some previous like I will be maybe maintaining some kind of momentum in which I was moving earlier and let us say at this point the gradient is suggested to be here right. So, instead of moving entirely in this direction I will probably move in in a combination of the like basically sort of a linear combination of these two vectors and that means I will next step I will move somewhere over here then somewhere over here somewhere over here 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 and that is how I would eventually converge to the optimal solution. So, you can see it gets a much smoother sort of convergence behavior right, but at the cost of also storing the value of the uh, previous update. So, if you are just using x k and if you are just using the info gradient information and just storing the value of x k then I would not be able to implement this right. In order to implement this algorithm I need to know this this particular direction right gradient in the previous step and gradient in the current step to be able to move in this direction. So, at the expense of using storing an additional information I can have a much smoother convergence. Now, think of it in terms of when you are training neural networks where you already have billions of parameters to work with right. So, that means you are storing twice the number of parameters that I mean with gradient descent you are storing just the number of parameters that you have in your network with the uh, with like with second order method which also uses momentum you would be using twice storing twice the number of parameters right. 
and that and depending on the compute that you may you, you may have uh, i mean it may take more time even though you may have nicer convergence and so on right just because it's memory inefficient it may converge faster in terms of number of iterations but it may be memory inefficient so the optimization like the first order and the second order optimization algorithm that way have a trade off but generally with momentum you can uh, you can have a much smoother sort of uh, convergence behavior and in the subsequent lectures we are going to be analyzing uh, optimization algorithms uh, which are momentum based as well and we'll see that in fact you get accelerated convergence behavior with uh, momentum based algorithms then then using something uh, as simple as gradient descent okay so so focus for today's lecture is going to be analyzing gradient descent al algorithm entirely and then uh, we will, in the subsequent lectures we'll move towards advanced uh, second order methods is that clear all right so let's start a discussion on gradient descent so we are going to be working assuming that function f is convex right if it's not convex then we cannot guarantee convergence to global optimum so we are going to be assuming that f is convex and we are also going to be assuming that f is l smooth so See, we are going to be working under these assumptions that f is convex and l smooth. Is this clear? And as I said uh, in the beginning of the lecture, that we are going to be arriving at the optimal sort of rate, and let's see how we can do that. All right. So, gradient descent algorithm is going to be x k plus one is going to be. I mean, you're going to be defining it as x k minus eta times. Okay, that, that's how the gradient descent algorithm works. And the, so the, I mean, let's say if we know that the function is convex and L smooth, the question is how you can arrive, I mean, how can one arrive at the optimal uh, learning rate in, let us say the current iterate is, current iterate is xk. Okay. So f of y is going to be using Taylor's expansion f of x k plus gradient of f of x k transpose y minus x k plus half y minus x k transpose Hessian of f evaluated at a point z which is which lies on the line connecting x k plus x k and y times y minus x k. Everyone with me on this? So this is using Taylor's expansion. So this holds for some z that basically lies on the line joining x k and y, right? So this holds with equality. I mean, otherwise it's a Taylor's approximation if I had used an x k instead of z. But if you, if you, I mean, you can, it holds with the equality for some point z lying on the uh, line connecting y and x k. Okay. So why did we use this thing? So we know that function is L smooth, right? So the function is L smooth. What do we know about the uh, Hessian of f? No, this is just a Taylor's expansion. Like uh, this property of z joining x k and y. Yeah, so this is like Taylor's expansion is approximation. Like if I trunk it up to second degree, if I had used instead of z, instead of if I had used x k, then it's an approximation, right? It's not an exact equality. It's an exact equality for some z. I mean, we do not know what z that is. For z, you, there exists some z connecting and it, this is true for any function, any analytical function, any analytical function. There exists some z such that this is satisfied with equality that z lies in the line connecting these two points x k and y. Okay. So, all right. So, because the function is L smooth, what do we know about the Hessian of the function? Yeah. So, Hesh, norm of the Hessian is less than or equal to L, right. So that means f i is going to be 
less than f of x k plus gradient f of x k transpose y minus x k plus l over 2 times y minus x k is norm square. Why? Because if I look at the last term here, norm of the Hessian is less than or equal to L. So, so this becomes less than or equal to L and you get y minus x k norm square. So, this becomes L by 2 norm y minus x k norm square. And now you get this with inequality. Okay. So, what can we say about the right hand side? So, we know that the current iterate is x k. Okay. So, let me rearrange the term and okay and then I can add and subtract 1 over L square. Okay. So, this is equal to, so if I look at the these three terms, what does this give me? So, this is equal to, first let me write this. So, this is a function of x k, this is a function of x k, this term is a function of y right. Now, I want to, so what we, what do we get? F y is less than or equal to this particular thing. Now, I want to minimize the, I want to make this bound tighter. So, I want to minimize this with respect to y, choose the y such that the right hand side is minimized. And how do we do that? If this term, if you can set this term to 0, so that means if I choose y to be x k minus 1 over L gradient of f of x k, then we know that this, this basically this is anyway going to be independent of y. So, the only term that you can min, like minimize is just by making this particular term equal to 0 and this essentially tells you that f of x and so this is what I going, what I am going to be calling it as x k plus 1. Sorry, yeah 1 by 2 L, thank you. Okay. So, my, so what do we get? f of x k plus 1 in that case is less than or equal to f of x k minus 1 by 2 L times x k square and the definition of x k essentially is x k minus Okay. And this is how you get this 1 over L kind of learning rate. Because you want to minimize this term on the right hand side, the bound on the right hand side and this bound is minimized if I choose, if I basically make this term to be equal to 0. It is a constant uh, for the L smoothness. Yeah, but then if I look at it now, this is a particular update rule. 1 over L is the learning rate, right? Yeah, so you get that learning rate interpretation from this this particular uh, equivalence. So that eta is equal to one over L that we talked about in the beginning of the lecture. That is how you are sort of getting it over here. This one. So this also tells you how how your f k, f of x k is decreasing, right? So one thing is this is how you are changing your x. But then how basically what is the bound on the function value? So, you can clearly see for instance, uh, I mean because the function is the sequence first of all, you are always decreasing. I mean it also tells you that f of x k is monotonically non-increasing, right? Because you, you subtract a positive value or a non-negative value every time. So, f of x is uh, monotonically non-increasing. 
on rather non increasing not monotonically but unless the gradient becomes zero right so it's only when the gradient becomes zero it's when you basically arrive at the optimal solution you cannot decrease any further so you arrive at the optimal solution but otherwise the uh, uh, yeah so it basically tells you by how much amount the function value decreases okay so as long as the gradient is non zero f of xk plus 1 is strictly less than f of xk okay so this is your gradient descent and for l smooth function uh, the sort of eta a good suitable choice for eta is 1 over l for l smooth function in in, in general you do not know the smoothness of like the lipschitz coefficient of the gradient or Lip, uh, lipschitz constant for the gradient of the function or the l smoothness coefficient you do not know in practice so in practice we try different learning rates uh, for functions at least for the functions for which we do not know the value of l but let's say if you happen to know the value of l maybe you do not know the optimal solution but you happen to know the value of l this would be uh, i mean basically this would be in some sense an optimal choice for the learning rate okay so let me write down a theorem suppose f of x is convex and l smooth so in the next lecture we are also going to be looking at uh, like i mean implementation and we'll, we are going to gain some, some insights for different types of function but yeah smooth then for uh, gradient descent with step size 1 over l we have f of x k plus 1 minus f of x star where x star is the optimal solution or optimize like yeah so this is less than or equal to l by 2 times norm of Okay, so this basically tells you how much the function would have decreased. So let's say you start at x naught. Okay, and x star is the optimal solution. So depending on how far you start from x naught uh, or the x star, this basically tells you that after k plus k plus one iteration, this is how you much going like your function value is going to be decreasing. So this is nothing but order one over k, right? So does everyone understand this big O notation? Is anyone here who does not understand big O notation? So big O, like let's say you say uh, g of x is big O of h of x. What does that mean? Yeah. So g, it's less than or equal to some m times h of x for some x for all x greater than or equal to some x naught. That that is what big O notation is, right? So let us say if I define h n to be n square minus 2 n plus 3 n cube. So what is uh, what is the order of this uh, like big O of if I try to define that. So for n greater than uh, n greater than 1 or I mean in this case yeah. So this is going to be less than equal to n cube plus 2 n cube plus 3 n cube. So this is this is equal to uh, 6 n cube. Right? So h n h of n is basically big O n cube for all n greater than equal to 1. Is this clear? So we also define something called rate of convergence and order of convergence. So when we talk about a sequence, let us say a sequence x, so which converges to some x star, suppose this is equal to rho, okay, for q greater than or equal to 1. So this rho is called 
रेट ऑफ कन्वर्जेंस एंड दिस क्यू ग्रेटर देन इक्वल टू वन दिस थिंग इज कॉल्ड ऑर्डर ऑफ कन्वर्जेंस फॉर अ सीक्वेंस एक्स विच कन्वर्जेस टू एक्स्ट्रा दिस इज हाउ वी डिफाइन द रेट एंड दी ऑर्डर so we are going to be comparing different algorithms in terms of the rates of convergence and the order of convergence and so on so just to keep this in mind this is this, this is the uh, context that we are going to be using this one so absolute value of hn it's going to be upper bounded by this right for n greater than equal to 1 n square is less than equal to n cube minus 2n is less than equal to 2n cube and so on right yeah for n greater than equal to 1 so the definition of the order is that there exists some x not which in this case n n greater than equal to 1 and some constant like this so in this case m is equal to 6 so then then you can say that uh, h of n is order n cube now how are these results useful these kind of results so the idea is suppose i want uh, so essentially i want closeness like let's say i want to make sure that uh, after k, like i want to arrive uh, epsilon close to the optimal solution so then 1 over k is uh, essentially 1 over k is you set it to be f, to be equal to epsilon or k is basically 1 over epsilon right so it basically tells you that you if you want to get epsilon close to the optimal solution then you need to have 1 over epsilon uh, order of num number of iterations of the algorithm in order to guarantee that and that's how you're going to be reading or at least interpreting these uh, these kind of results okay so suppose you want to get epsilon close so this term you want to make it equal to epsilon which is almost saying that 1 over k or some like order 1 over k is what which is i mean will be close to epsilon so basically your number of iterations required to get 1 uh, uh, epsilon close to the optimal value that would be order 1 over epsilon so you need as many uh, iterations to converge to the or get close to the optimal solution epsilon close to the optimal solution so the smaller the number of iterations the faster the algorithm is and then we for different types of algorithm or maybe what you are going to see is if we assume f to be strongly convex then we can have uh, faster rates than what we have with uh, simply convex right so these are some of the things that we are going to be looking at in the next class